As of 2023, writer and comedian Elaine May has directed four feature films. One in 1971, one in 1972, one in 76, and one in 1987. May is still alive at 91 years young, but she hasn't directed a feature since 1987's Ishtar, a film so hated that it spawned a new term, movie jail, a way to describe filmmakers whose perceived failure is so profound that they would no longer be allowed to helm a movie ever again. Despite a budget of $55 million, the film grossed only $14 million, and production difficulties plagued an already difficult shoot. Elaine May and crew dealt with everything from scorching heat from the Moroccan desert to rumors that Palestinian terrorists were attempting to kidnap star Dustin Hoffman. And of course, the infamous flattening of the desert that cost $75,000, 10 days of manpower, and ultimately amounted to only a few minutes of screen time. Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty hate the film, but is it truly a failure deserving of its negative reputation as one of the worst films of all time? Or is it actually a misunderstood masterpiece? Martin Scorsese seems to think so, considering it one of his favorite films of all time. And what about director Elaine May? What does she think about all of this? Uh, if all of the people who hate Ishtar had seen it, I would be a rich woman today. <laughs> In today's episode of When the Pictures Got Bigger, we're going to look at it all, from Ishtar's humble beginnings to its dark depths, and ask the question, how did it all go so wrong? In order to understand Ishtar, we must first understand Elaine May, the film's director. May was born Elaine Berlin in April of 1932, the daughter of traveling theater performers. When Elaine was three, she joined her parents' traveling troupe, performing all over the country at the expense of going to school. By the time she was 16, she was married with child, performing odd jobs as she tried to enroll in college. However, most colleges required a high school diploma, which Elaine did not have, and so she hitched a ride to the one school that would take her without formal education, the University of Chicago. Elaine made a name for herself in Chicago as one of the school's worst students, regularly disrupting lectures and getting into huge fights with her professors. One night, Elaine met someone who shared her reputation, Mike Nichols, introduced to Elaine as the only other person on campus who's as hostile as you. Mike and Elaine became fast friends, bonding over their love of improv and shared interest in comedy. The two worked together for the Compass Players, a local comedy troupe that eventually would ask Nichols to leave as he was apparently too funny. May would leave with him in solidarity. Together they began their own comedy routine, Nichols and May, performing at local comedy clubs and eventually gaining worldwide attention. By 1960, they were on Broadway, performing an evening with Mike Nichols and Elaine May. Their comedy was fresh, it was exciting, and it played perfectly with younger audiences. Mike and Elaine were a new kind of comedy team. They didn't fall under the similar trappings of most comedic duos, where one member is smart and the other is dumb. Mike and Elaine were equals, and their routines were almost verbal sparring matches, with Elaine doing everything possible to try and get Mike to break character and laugh. The two also satirized the brand new intellectual culture that dominated New York. Suddenly, everyone was in on the joke. And as Mike and Elaine grew larger and more well-known, they expanded their scopes beyond Broadway and into film and television. In 1967, Mike would direct a little film called The Graduate, and Elaine would cameo in a minor role. Mike Nichols began to expand his career, but Elaine wasn't going to let her friend pull too far ahead. In 1971, she directed her first of four films, A New Leaf. A New Leaf is a lot of things. It's a funny, dark comedy about a playboy who has wasted all of his inheritance money and decides his best way to get more will be to marry into it. Although, the woman he chooses to go after is none other than May herself, who wrote, directed, and starred in the film. It was also the first Hollywood film since 1965 to be directed by a woman, and it was a major success. Elaine would follow it up one year later with my second favorite of her four works, The Heartbreak Kid. This was another comedy, starring Charles Grodin as a man who has just married a wife he doesn't love, and Sybil Shepherd as a young woman who happens to be vacationing at the same place Grodin is spending his honeymoon. Suddenly, Grodin decides he wants to leave his wife and marry Shepherd. The film also stars Jeannie Berlin as Grodin's wife. If the last name Berlin sounds familiar, that's because this is Elaine's daughter. Once again, the film was a huge success. Now Elaine was on fire. 
She seemed to understand comedy in a way no other filmmaker did, and she became the first ever female director to have final cut under a Hollywood studio. Paramount gave Elaine a blank check for her next film. She held the key to the kingdom. And what did she do with that? 1976's Mikey and Nicky, my favorite of May's directed works and one of the best films of all time. This is a gangster film, a far cry from Elaine's previous comedies, in which follows two friends named Mikey and Nicky. Nicky has stolen money from a mob boss, and he calls up his friend Mikey in a panic, terrified that his life is in danger. Mikey does his best to calm Nicky down throughout the night, but Nicky is inconsolable. He is paranoid and feels as though he is only mere hours from death. The entire film takes place in one night, and the ending climax holds its own as one of the best finishes to a film ever. Unfortunately, Mikey and Nicky has only become beloved through time, and it was far from popular upon release. The film bombed, going over budget and over schedule, and Elaine's final cut privileges were revoked after only one chance. She no longer held the keys. May took a break from directing, but she wasn't done in the industry. She saved his career through this film and put him on the map as a major Hollywood star and filmmaker. Whatever May wanted from Beatty, Beatty would give to her. Warren Beatty, though, was not the only megastar that owed his success to May. In 1982, she did uncredited rewrites on the box office juggernaut Tootsie. Suddenly, all eyes were back on Elaine. She had just helped write two huge hits and had two major actors extremely grateful for her. Warren Beatty and Tootsie star Dustin Hoffman. Beatty in particular felt that Elaine deserved another shot at the director's chair, and he began looking for material that could suit her. He asked May what she wanted to make, and she responded that she wanted to return to comedy and make an adventure comedy called Ishtar, and she thought she could get Dustin Hoffman to star alongside Beatty. After all, he owed her for Tootsie. Despite initially turning it down, Hoffman eventually agreed. Suddenly, the whole world was watching. Although studio opinions on May were low, it's hard to understate just how much pool Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman had in the mid-1980s. They were huge, mega stars, and Beatty went to film studio Columbia to pitch Ishtar with one sentence. Anything she wants, period. Columbia was reluctant to trust Elaine May after Mikey and Nicky, but Beatty and Hoffman together in leading roles was too good an offer to pass up. The film was greenlit, and began with a budget of $27.5 million. Already, this made it one of the most expensive films ever made. Keep in mind, though, this 27.5 number is going to grow. To go into a bit more detail, Ishtar is a movie about a lot of things. It starts by following Chuck Clark and Lyle Rogers in New York City, two down-on-their-luck musicians who would do anything to be the next Simon and Garfunkel. Their only problem? Their music stinks. This is our entire first act, and it's a completely different movie than an adventure comedy in the desert. It's an underdog story about two musicians who have a dream. Then, quite randomly and unexpectedly, Clark and Roger's manager tells them he has booked them a gig in Morocco. They decide to take it. Here's where things get a little strange. While in the fictional country of Ishtar for a layover, Clark and Rogers get mixed up with a mysterious woman, and Chuck agrees to be a mole for the CIA. They then accidentally become involved in a plan to overthrow the leader of Ishtar, and hilarity ensues. The plot doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and some people argue it doesn't have to. It's a comedy about ordinary people in extraordinary situations. And I'm inclined to agree, despite it being a bit too much still for me. What's endlessly more fascinating than the film itself, though, is how production went so poorly. Initially, Elaine May and Columbia wanted to fake the desert scenes in the southern United States. It would be cheaper, it would save time, and it would be safer. Unfortunately, Columbia was owned by Coca-Cola in the 1980s, and Coca-Cola had money in Morocco that it could not repatriate. It had to be spent somehow, so Coke figured why not send the movie crew to Morocco, and they can use that money there. Filming began in the real Sahara Desert, with the idea being that they would remain in Morocco for 10 weeks. That's it. Unfortunately, Morocco was far from a safe haven in 1986. Elaine May and crew entered the country while it was on the brink of war. Israeli warplanes were bombing Palestine, and the Moroccan military was battling a nationalist party attempting to reclaim the Sahara Desert. The country was also overrun with Palestinian terrorists, and the filming crew received several anonymous tips that Dustin Hoffman's life was in danger, as the terrorists sought to kidnap him. 
Before shooting, filming locations had to be checked for landmines. And if that wasn't enough, there were also high tensions on set. Beatty and Hoffman may have been doing the film as a favor to May, but that didn't mean they made it easy for her. One of the principal cast members in the film was Isabel Adjani, who was Warren's girlfriend at the time. May didn't really care about this fact, and she would push Isabel through grueling shoots for long hours, angering Beatty, who would frequently lash out at May. Elaine would fire back, and she would often leave sets for hours at a time to cool down. Elaine was also a strict perfectionist, and her hundreds of takes and desire for a flawless production added more time and more money to Ishtar's ballooning budget. In one scene, vultures fly down and land next to our heroes. May shot this over 50 times. And then there's her infamous flattening of the dunes. One of the issues with filming on location is that the location shapes the scene, and not the other way around. The Sahara Desert is obviously full of sand dunes. It's a desert. But May didn't like the look of the rolling hills of sand, and so she called for a team to flatten the dunes. This request cost the production team 10 days and almost $100,000. If you remember, they only wanted to remain in Morocco for 70 days total. But in May's defense, this shoot wasn't easy on her. She frequently suffered from toothaches and sunburns, but refused to get treated. She also dealed with pushback from Warren and Dustin, yes, but also from other crew members like cinematographer Vittorio Storaro, who kept attempting to shoot the film as a drama when Elaine was looking for a peak comedy. In general, a lot of the crew didn't seem to understand where the film was going or even what genre it occupied. However, while most eventually gave in and decided to just let May direct the film she wanted, Warren Beatty refused. When the scenes in Morocco finished filming and the entire crew returned to New York, Warren went behind Elaine's back and went to Columbia's head, claiming that Elaine had no idea how to direct a film. When the head offered to fire her, Warren declined, citing women's rights as his reason. His new proposal was that all remaining scenes be shot twice, once Elaine's way and once his way. This doubled the cost of the film. But it gets worse. When principal production finally wrapped, Warren Beatty wanted to continue the idea of his film versus Elaine's by hiring his own team of editors. Dustin Hoffman was offered the same proposition as well. Suddenly, Ishtar made history by having three teams of editors, all cutting the exact same film. There was Elaine's version, Dustin's version, and Warren's version. This extended the post-production, pushing the film back from a 1986 release to a 1987 one. The media had a field day, spreading rumors about production issues and blaming these issues on Warren's ego, calling the film Warren's Gate after the notorious Heaven's Gate, one of the biggest movie disasters of all time, and maybe the subject of a future episode if people are interested. Warren's Gate was just one of many nicknames given to Ishtar. My personal favorite is Ishtar and Feathered. Ishtar and Feathered. I mean Ishtar, began nearing completion in early 1987, but the tensions between the studio and stars were unprecedented. Up until days before release, the different cuts were swapping hands and being mixed together in unnatural ways. Warren notoriously wanted more screen time for his girlfriend at Johnny, but Elaine wanted her cut to be the only one that was used. Let Dustin and Warren have their pet projects, but her vision would be the one hitting theaters to become a box office success. The editors, by the way, were furious with all of this, and not a single one was on the same page. Just before release, Elaine took her version and hid it from the studio head. She wasn't going to let anybody watch it, and it was going to theaters. At the same time, Columbia was undergoing a change in leadership. It became the perfect storm. A man named David Putnam was in charge, and while Putnam was fine with Elaine and would ultimately let her film hit theaters, he hated Dustin Hoffman and especially Warren Beatty, finding both of them to be too arrogant for their own good, and calling Hoffman the most malevolent person I have ever had to work with. So what did he do? Although not confirmed, it is heavily rumored that he began leaking to the press that Ishtar was a failure and that people should avoid seeing it. For Putnam, it was a gamble. Sure, his new company Columbia would lose money on the film, but it would show megastars that they cannot put themselves above the studio, and that ultimately, the studio owns them. By the time Ishtar was finally released, the budget had grown from an already expensive $27.5 million to an estimated $51 million. This made it the fourth most expensive film ever made at the time. And when you look at the three that beat it, Superman, Rambo 3, and Total Recall, Ishtar sticks out like a sore thumb. And unfortunately, our story ends on a sadder note. The film only made $14 million. Reviews were bad, 
everyone lost money, and a new term was coined for Elaine May. Movie jail, the place she would go never to direct another film again. Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty avoided the same reputation, with Hoffman winning an Oscar the very next year for his role in Rain Man. In the decades since Ishtar, the film has been called everything from a misunderstood masterpiece to one of the 100 worst ideas of the 20th century, alongside such classics as The Treaty of Versailles and New Coke. Ultimately, I'll leave it up to you to come to your own conclusion, but I will say that in my opinion, the film was fine. If it weren't for its reputation, it would be ultimately fairly forgettable. Dustin Hoffman is probably my favorite actor of all time, but he's underutilized. Elaine May is one of the funniest writers of all time, but her jokes aren't delivered effectively. And Warren Beatty is one of the most polarizing figures of all time, but his character doesn't lend itself to controversy. Ishtar is okay, but it's definitely the weakest of Elaine May's films, and it's a shame that it is the one that's now synonymous with her. Mikey and Nikki is phenomenal, and I would highly recommend watching that one instead. Hollywood tends to define people by their failures instead of their successes, and Elaine May deserves to be celebrated as one of the most gifted comedians of all time. Until the next time, I'll see you at the movies.